Welcome back to the DeFi MOOC. My name is Andrew Miller, and I'm going to be giving the lecture on an introduction to smart contracts. So the outline for uh, what this lecture is going to be is the following. We're going to start by talking about smart contracts uh, from a high level point of view and, and focusing on them as the programming framework that programmers would see when they are trying to build programs to run on the blockchain. Um, the main idea here is that you shouldn't even think about smart contracts as contracts. They're neither smart nor are they contracts. Instead, uh, just think of smart contracts as the program objects that live on the blockchain. Or to use Dan's uh, notion from the last lecture, uh, smart contracts are the uh, programs that run on the blockchain computer. Uh, after the high-level conceptual overview, we'll talk about um, the basics of Solidity programming in Ethereum. We're not going to go very deep into how the Solidity programming language works. Instead, we're just going to be focusing on giving you enough about it that you can follow the DeFi examples that we'll see later on in the course. Um, we'll go into some detail on making a case study out of the CryptoKitties uh, auction mechanism. So if you're interested in the current craze around NFTs, then um, you'll want to know about how this works because CryptoKitties were probably the first successful NFT on a blockchain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you could think of a comparison between smart contracts and legal contracts. And finally, we'll, we'll delve into one of the most important kinds of smart contracts, which are tokens. We'll, we'll talk about fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens as well. First, we're going to look at a high-level view of smart contracts uh, conceptually from the programmer's point of view. So from the opening segments on blockchain technology, you should have an understanding of the digital asset or cryptocurrency applications you can build on top of a blockchain, where the blockchain is a consensus system that is keeping track of account balances for all of the different user accounts in the system, and the users can interact with this public consensus system by transferring portions of their digital asset money uh, amongst themselves according to the rules of the application. Now, to think about smart contracts, uh, the way to think about them is that it is a generalization of this digital asset application. And it's a generalization because you can now make Instead of keeping track of accounts, the blockchain is keeping track of user-defined program objects called contracts. So what we call smart contracts are really program objects that live on the blockchain. And each program object consists of two parts. It consists of some code describing what to do when users interact with it. And it contains uh, or it describes storage, like a file or a memory space. Sometimes we call it the state. But anyway, it's some persistent data that is stored for the contract and kept track of by the blockchain. Now, in addition to transferring digital assets between users in the systems, users can also interact with these contract objects by passing them input data and invoking functions or methods defined in the code for these contract objects. So you can think of this as like an operating system where the processes in the operating system are the smart contracts. And the objects in this operating system can interact with each other and they can take input from users and they can provide output to users and their code describes how they process the inputs and how they will update their storage. Now, it's helpful to go straight to an example of a fragment of smart contract code. So, uh, this is in Solidity. We'll talk more about that later. It's defining one contract called my registry. So that's defining uh, an object in uh, this. Uh, it's defining one program object that will run on this blockchain operating system. And what we said is that every contract object consists of some storage. So here the code is defining uh, a registry file. So it's a mapping from strings like domain names to addresses, like the account of who's going to own that name. And in addition to the storage, the smart contract also defines uh, the code uh, for methods that handle input from users. So in this case, this registry contract has a single method called register domain, and you can call it passing in a string as a parameter, and you call register domain with the string domain in order to 
register that domain to take it for yourself. Now in the body of this function, what it is describing it's doing is first of all, it's going to check that the domain you're trying to register is currently not assigned to anyone. Uh, so by default, everything in this registry will be mapped to zero, meaning no one owns it. And so this is going to be checking that that's the case. No one owns this domain yet. And then the next line of this uh, program code is that it is going to update the storage file. It's going to update that registry variable by assigning the entry in this registry for domain to message.sender, which stands for whoever is calling this register domain function. So in this way, when you call register domain, it's going to update the storage of this contract to say that you are now the owner of that domain. Now, just to give a depiction of what this looks like, uh, graphically, the contract object has lives on the blockchain. It has registry as its storage, and it has the register domain method. Someone who wants to go register the domain, say they're registering defi.io, they will invoke the register domain method of that smart contract, passing that string in as a parameter. And once this register domain function's been invoked, anyone in the network, either looking at a block explorer or running their own full node, they can query the registry to look up who is the current owner of a given domain name they're interested in. So next what I want to do is show you what an instance of the smart contract object uh, domain name registry example would look like on the test network. So I have already previously compiled and put onto the blockchain an instance of this my registry object and it lives on the Covan test network which I can view in the Etherscan block explorer here. I could also view it by connecting a full node directly to the Covan test network, but I'm just gonna show you here what it looks like on the uh, test network through the block explorer. So what you can see is that there's a, a contract created with this address. Uh, it was created a couple of weeks ago to prepare for this course. And you can see the high level solidity source code um, for this contract object. It looks essentially the same as uh, what I just showed you on the slide there. Now you can see the events that are associated with this contract object. So basically I'm recording an event every time a domain has been registered. And I can see it in this events tab of Etherscan. And I have to go adjust all of these. Essentially this is showing me an event for who's registered which domain. And you can see here that I have registered with my address. I have registered the berkeleydefi.github.io address in this little example domain name registry. So here the uh, block explorer for the test network is showing me the state that has been changed associated with the smart contract object as a result of invoking the register domain method on it. Uh, the next a uh, concept to talk about is interaction between contracts. So not only can a user go and invoke a method of a contract object, but the code of the contract object can also describe how to send messages and invoke methods of other contracts. So a common pattern um, that shows up is the idea of a multi-sig account where a few different users are jointly in control over the money held by this contract object. So there would be a contract object describing their jointly held account. It would have some amount of money that it stores, and it would define a method that the owners of this account can use to approve a request. So in order to approve a transaction request on this jointly held account, uh, two or more of the owners of the account would have to invoke the sign request method. Then the code for this sign request method could in turn call a method of another contract that they want to interact with. So here, uh, the joint account contract is calling the place bid method of some auction contract. And this had to be authorized by say two or more of those users who are the owners of it. Now this auction contract in turn may further invoke methods of other contracts. So for example, if these users jointly holding an account won an auction, they placed the winning bid to buy an NFT digital asset. Well, then the auction contract might invoke the transfer token method of the digital asset contract in order to 
accept their money for the bid, but transfer them the NFT that they had won in the auction. So this is really powerful. You can write code uh, in the smart contracts that not only update the local storage associated with that smart contract, but that also invoke methods of other contracts that are all existing together, coexisting on this blockchain network. And uh, this kind of ability to build up uh, systems of smart contract objects that all interact with each other, this is one of the really important ways in which the smart contract programming model is so flexible. And we'll see more examples of this later on as we build up to DeFi smart contracts. So let's recap what we've talked about so far. Uh, we have talked about the high-level idea that smart contracts are program objects living on the blockchain. And each program object uh, is defined by a smart contract class in, in smart contract code, and it's defining both the storage that the smart contract uh, stores, that the blockchain is keeping track of for that smart contract, and this contract class also defines the program code that describes how the contract object uh, reacts to uh, inputs and method invocations made either by users or by other smart contracts on the system. Uh, we have looked at how to define storage fields and functions and methods. We'll look at more syntax examples a little bit later on. We've also seen uh, this concept of access control. So we saw a require method that checked that some conditions were met and it would cancel the transaction. You know, it would not reserve the domain name in our example uh, if it was already reserved. And in general, you, we saw how you can look at the sender, uh, whoever it is, you can look at the address of who invoked a method, which is also used in access control to, for example, make it so that only the owner of a domain name could transfer it to someone else. And we've also talked about composition, basically how smart contract objects can interact with each other by invoking methods on each other. And we'll see more examples of this later on. So let's leave with um, a short quiz before the next section. So here is um, the same registry example code. And what I want you to think about is what could go wrong? I've given you this domain name example and even shown you a testnet instance of it. And it's a really simple domain name system. It just has that one register domain method, which in turn only has two lines of code in it. So even if you don't you know, fully understand every aspect of the smart contract programming language, maybe you can see enough and use your knowledge of blockchain systems from the earlier segments to um, think about what might go wrong. So um, there is at least one problem with this, one vulnerability that this uh, smart contract has. So can you think about what would be the problem and what you might do to fix it? And in general, also think about what is missing. This is a really simplistic domain name system. How could you imagine making this more useful? What other features would you expect a real domain name system to have?